Cruising the Nile in Egypt is not like any other river cruise experience in the world. We're going to show you what it's like, the type of ship you'll be sailing on, the food, the river, the people, and the incredible ancient history. This is not clickbait when we genuinely say this trip challenged us in so many ways and changed the way we think about Egypt forever. Stay tuned as we reveal why and show you what you need to know about cruising the Nile. Accompanied, of course, by lots of pretty video. You'll find this video broken into chapters and although we would love for you to watch it all the way through for the complete experience, you can jump to the bit you fancy watching most. Surely the main reason to visit Egypt as a tourist is to see the utterly unique and wonderfully preserved artifacts and monuments of ancient civilizations? Well, on a river cruise with a decent, well-established company like Uniworld, the company we sailed with, all these experiences are built into your time here perfectly and seamlessly. In a stark contrast to ocean cruises, where in many cases the ship is the resort and therefore the destination, river cruising is nearly always focused not on the ship, but the destinations you visit. Egypt serves up its destinations like no other location on Earth. I'm going to take the next few minutes to run through a few of the highlights from our week on the Nile in chronological order. This is only a whistle-stop tour, but it's loaded with interesting facts and figures. For the full experience, well, we had to leave a little for you to explore yourself when you come. Sit back, relax, and be prepared for your jaw to drop at regular intervals. Let's go! Just outside Cairo, and we could actually see this from our hotel balcony, is the Alabaster Mosque. It's not called the most visible mosque in Cairo for nothing, you know. It's located within Saladin's Citadel of Cairo complex. Saladin began construction in 1176, so of course the citadel is rich in Egyptian history. In more recent centuries, the citadel is where King Muhammad Ali, considered to be the founder of modern Egypt, lived and worked and built the Alabaster Mosque, with its silver-domed roof and two towers to call the city to prayer. The mosque itself is large and ornate, and completely made out of alabaster, hence the name. It is still a working mosque and is closed to tourists every Friday so that a religious service can take place. It was built between 1830 and 1848. The dome is 21 meters in diameter and rises up to 52 meters from the ground. This is an impressive and beautiful start to the cruise, and that was just the first morning. The Egyptian Museum is located in the heart of the city, but by the time you watch this, it may have been relocated. Cairo is completing a new Grand Egyptian Museum just two kilometers from the Pyramids of Giza on the outskirts of Cairo, and at the time of this video's release has yet to be opened. It is due to be opened in November 2022. So, whilst many of the exhibits have already been moved, there are still plenty of significant treasures to see here. Now, this was definitely one excursion I've been looking forward to almost as much as the pyramids. Why? Because at the time of our visit, King Tutankhamun's gold tomb and burial mask were on display, and we got to see it up close. Unfortunately, and for some mystifying reason, we were not allowed photography of any kind in the room where the treasures were on display, so I couldn't get any footage at all. Odd, seeing as the pharaoh's death mask is one of the most recognisable, iconic and photographed physical artefacts in the world. I'll tell you now though, nothing beats seeing it with your own eyes and you could literally get a few centimetres from it here. We'll bring you more about Tutankhamun later because we actually got to meet him in person. Yes, actually him, not looking a day over 3,356 years old, face to face. Hmm, stay tuned for that. Just to the southeast of the small town of Dendera is the Dendera Temple Complex, which includes the Temple of Hathor, one of the best preserved temples in Egypt. No, I didn't say Hapthor, I said Hathor. The whole complex covers some 40,000 square meters. It really is a gem and you'll be completely blown away by the clarity and detail in the preserved wall and ceiling carvings and paintings, which are thousands of years old. This is the only temple with a roof because of it being completely buried and preserved in sand for a couple of thousand years. Walid, our fabulous guide, also explained it is believed that the temple sits on top of an even older temple since they discovered pillar stones in the ground which are thought to be about 30 meters deep. Whether or not we will ever see this hidden temple and the treasures within is another matter as the excavation would risk the integrity of the beautiful temple that sits on top of it. 
UNESCO-listed Karnak is nothing short of jaw-dropping in terms of scale and history. At its peak, it was the largest and most important religious complex in ancient Egypt, spread over two square kilometers. The Temple of Amun-Ra, considered to be where the god Amun-Ra lived on earth with his wife and son, was the largest religious building ever built. Its 54,000 square feet Great Hall is large enough to fit the Cathedral of Notre Dame comfortably inside. Karnak is a massive temple complex where dozens of pharaohs added their own constructions over the centuries. This obelisk was built by Queen Hapship Suit. Oh, that's quite a tongue twister. The only female pharaoh. More about her in a minute or two. Over 80,000 servants and slaves were assigned the task of serving Amun-Ra in Karnak, showing his power and importance at the time, and 5,000 statues were erected in his honor. It's Egypt's second most visited site after the pyramids, and with good reason. There's too much information to share about Karnak than we have time for here, but this place really has to be seen to be believed. On the way to the temple of Hat Ship Suit, which is on the way to the Valley of the Kings, is a couple of mysterious statues called the Colossi of Memnon. Why mysterious? Well, every sunrise something strange happens. Due to an earthquake in 27 BC, the northern Colossus was partly destroyed. After the earthquake, what was left of the northern Colossus started to sing at dawn. The noise was described as a blow by a Greek historian named Strabo, who heard the sound on his visit to the Colossi in 20 BC. Legend says that it brought good luck to those who listened to its strange haunting song. The Colossi's mystery spread beyond Egypt, which brought many foreign visitors, including several Roman emperors, in search of the blessing that the vocal Memnon would bring. Many scholars and scientists and experts through history right up to modern times have tried to demystify the vocal Memnon, but no explanation has been found. The Temple of Hatship Suit is a relatively contemporary temple architecturally set into the rock the other side of the Valley of the Kings. This temple is set over three floors with steps up to each level and inscriptions on the walls behind the columns. On the top floor is a small temple set into the sandstone rock. Hatship Suit was an unusual pharaoh, as she was the only woman of that era to rule as a pharaoh, convincing her people that she indeed was a man, so they would accept her as pharaoh. She even wore a false beard. Hatship Suit's status as the only female to rule Egypt was not the only reason for her fame. She was also a very successful pharaoh. She ruled over an era of peace and prosperity, expanding lucrative trade routes and pursuing economic prosperity rather than conquering new lands. You saw her obelisk in Karnak, and she ordered three more to be made to celebrate her 16th year as pharaoh. But during construction, the largest obelisk ever cut, one weighing nearly 1,100 tons, cracked and was subsequently abandoned. We'll see the unfinished obelisk later in the video. If you enjoy this video and are interested in knowing more about Uniworld's two brilliant ships on the Nile or any other luxury cruise, our preferred travel partner is Panache Cruises the elite ocean expedition, river and yacht style cruising specialists. The team at Panache has decades of combined knowledge and experience in finding the right cruise for you. For a completely personal service, their dedicated cruise connoisseurs will be at your side right from the initial inquiry until you get back from your dream cruise. They will help you with every aspect of your holiday, no question too big, no detail too small. Call them now on this number or visit their beautiful website and make your next dream cruise, like the one we've just taken on SS Sphinx, a reality. The Pyramids of Giza were the tombs of choice for pharaohs of Egypt's old kingdom, but new kingdom pharaohs, who wanted to be closer to the source of their dynastic roots in the south, built their crypts into the hills on the west bank of the Nile River near Luxor, which became known as the Valley of the Kings. Between 539 and 1075 BC, the valley became a royal burial ground for pharaohs such as Tutankhamun, Seti I and Ramesses II. The tombs became elaborate preparations for the next world, in which humans were promised continuing life and pharaohs were expected to become one with the gods. Mummification was used to preserve the body so that the deceased's eternal soul would be resurrected in the afterlife. The valley is an absolute must visit. It's a fascinating area of 63 underground tombs of varying complexity, depth and grandeur. More are yet to be discovered, so we are literally walking between hills that have yet to give up more of their secrets. Many would say that the most important tomb in the valley is that of King Tutankhamun. 
it is 1922 and the esteemed archaeologist Howard Carter, alongside his financial backer Lord Carnarvon, holds a flickering match up to the darkness. Hot air, trapped for thousands of years, escapes the ancient doorway. Ugh. Howard Carter takes up the story. As my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues and gold, everywhere, the glint of gold. And when Lord Carnarvon, unable to stand the suspense any longer, inquired anxiously, Can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words, Yes, wonderful things. As much as we were almost as speechless as Carter by the sight before us, due in part to the insistence by the attendants that there should be no speaking in the tomb, there is of course something rather more sinister to bear in mind, the legend of the curse of King Tutankhamun. Disturbing the king's embalmed remains has been said to bring bad luck, illness and death. As history will tell you, it didn't particularly end well for the expedition team of Howard Carter. Shortly after unearthing King Tut's tomb, Lord Carnarvon was found dead by an infected mosquito bite to his face. Carnarvon's half-brother also died from blood poisoning. Sir Archibald Douglas Reed died from mysterious illness, and George J. Gould died from a fever following his visit to Egypt, amongst many others. Objects from the tomb were given as gifts to Carter's friend Sir Bruce Ingram, whose house burned down not long after. Hmm, do you believe in the mummy's curse? Leave us a comment. Back to some semblance of normality now and the question would be why don't they transport the mummy of King Tut to the Egyptian Grand Museum to lay with all his wonderful things that were recovered from the tomb just as he did for over 3,000 years. Well, he will never be moved as his remains are so fragile any attempt to remove him from his tomb would result in his body turning to dust. Well, that and the curse of course. The Temple of Kom Ombo is situated literally on the shores of the Nile, so it was great to be able to make this visit on foot without having to get on the coach. We had just over an hour to wander around this temple which is unique because it is in fact a double temple dedicated to Sobek the Crocodile God and Horus the Falcon-Headed God. The layout combines two temples in one with each side having its own gateways and chapels. Adjacent to the Twin Temple is a modern-built crocodile museum, where visitors can see the remains of the mummified crocodiles that were kept in the temple for worshipping. Since the construction of the Aswan Dam, there are no longer living crocodiles in this part of the river. When we were in Aswan, Uniworld treated us to an afternoon tea at the Old Cataract Hotel, possibly the most famous hotel in Egypt, where Agatha Christie resided and wrote Death on the Nile. We've got a completely separate video all about the old cataract, so I'll leave a link in the top right corner now and also at the end. It's definitely worth a watch. Let's move on. Another excursion we're unfortunately not going to show you is Abu Simbel. This was an expensive excursion, so we decided against it. It's one of the crown jewels of Egypt's ancient portfolio. Next we visited Philae Temple, the Temple of Isis, which is located on a small island near the Old Dam. The temple was moved by the French between 1977 and 1980 to save it from its original island after the river flooded after construction of the Aswan Low Dam in 1902 and the temples became increasingly submerged. To move it, the temple was cut into 42,000 pieces, each weighing between 2 to 25 tons. Think of it like a giant Lego Creator Series construction kit. On steroids. The new island had to be extended to accommodate the whole temple and the whole operation was completed in just five years. It's amazing to think they got every one of those 42,000 pieces back together exactly where they originally were. Obelisks are fascinating monuments. How were they carved from just a single granite block? How were these thousand ton incredibly tall monuments transported over hundreds of miles? And how were these impossibly heavy columns raised in position once they arrived at their destination? When you're on your excursions, you'll learn all about how inconceivably ingenious the ancient Egyptian construction methods were. These monuments were cut from granite, just using wood chips and water. How? Well, leave a comment if you think you know. I'll have to leave you hanging there while we take a look at the unfinished obelisk, ordered to be built by Queen, yes, Hatship Suit, who seemed to be popping up quite a lot in this video. And being over a thousand tons of granite and 42 meters in length, whoever was responsible for that crack, well, I guess it didn't turn up for work the next day, you know what I mean? The Temple of Kunum, 
well, I hope I've pronounced that correctly, sits in the middle of the town of Esna at a level of about 9 metres below the town's modern day ground level, which represents 15 centuries of desert sand and debris accumulated since it was abandoned during the Roman period. Most of the temple, similar in size to the Temple of Dendera, is still covered by the old town. From the outside, it doesn't look too much different than the many other ancient buildings you would have already seen during your week-long and extremely busy schedule of excursions. But walk inside the Temple of Kunum and you'll find some immaculately preserved columns you'll not be able to take your eyes away from. Inside there are 24 pillars beautifully decorated with lotus floral and palm leaf capitals. These walls are covered with four rows of reliefs, showing Ptolemaic and Roman emperors dressed in pharaoh's costumes, offering sacrifices to the god Kunum, the ram-headed god of creation. The first capital city in Egypt was Memphis, hmm, not to be confused with Elvis Presley's Memphis. This place is a lot older. It was founded by Pharaoh Menes over 5,000 years ago. That's before Elvis was even born. In fact, Memphis is the site of the oldest pyramid in the world, the Djosa Pyramid. In fact, this is the oldest stone structure in the world, known as a step pyramid, and was constructed for Pharaoh Djosa between 2667 and 2648 BC, making it over 4,600 years old. It was designed by the architect Imhotep, who rose to more recent fame in the Hollywood mummy movies, but was equally as famous back in the Third Dynasty and oversaw many innovative building projects. Over the last few millennia, the site fell into disrepair with the ravages of desert winds, looters and general neglect, and after an earthquake in 1992, it was at risk of total collapse. After $6.6 .6 million and 14 years, the site was reopened to tourists as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2020. So what you see here is the product of some pretty cool restoration work. Also in Memphis is a monumental statue carved from limestone and measuring about 10 meters in length and it was discovered by Italian explorer Giovanni Battista Caviglia in 1820. The statue is displayed on its back because its feet and base are broken off and it was deemed too risky to move, so it's had a building built around it so it can be viewed. Who is the statue of? Some would say the greatest and most powerful pharaoh of all time, so much so he declared himself a god. Ramesses II. Ramesses II reigned for 67 years, had 67 wives and well over 100 concubines and 198 children, and built more statues and monuments than any other pharaoh. Hmm, <laughs> no wonder he's referred to Ramesses the Great. Well, he was great at something. Should have been called Ramesses the Randy. Originally, the statue was one of a pair. The second one was also found by Caviglia in 1820. It was restored to its full height in the 1950s and is now said to be upright and on display outside the new Grand Egyptian Museum in Cairo, which, as said before, is due to be opened in November 22. Wow, oh, we've gone full circle. Finally, you simply cannot come to Egypt without visiting one of the most famous ancient monument sites in the world, possibly the most famous. There are actually 118 pyramids in Egypt, but the three most famous ones are just outside Cairo on the Giza Plateau. The most famous one is of course the Great Pyramid and is the oldest of all the seven wonders of the world. For more than 3,800 years, it was the tallest man-made structure in the world. 3,800 years. It was constructed by 10,000 workers out of 2.3 million limestone blocks each weighing an average of 10 tons. This 23 million ton mass is held together literally just by its sheer weight. It took 20 years to build and the exact construction methods are still a mystery although scholars are pretty sure the ancient Egypt used vast sand ramps to haul these blocks higher and higher as they built from the inside out. Contrary to what you may have come to believe, the 10,000 workers who built the pyramids were not slaves. The builders were skilled, well-fed Egyptian workers who lived in a nearby temporary city. Archaeological digs on the site have revealed a highly organized community with the backing and resources of the local authorities. Inside there are three burial chambers, one cut into the bedrock but was never finished, and two halfway up in the middle. When opened, no mummies were found. Grave robbers over the millennia have been responsible for most of the treasures of ancient Egypt being lost forever, but the Great Pyramid was designed to fool any attempted looting. 
Over 110 hideaways and dead ends were found in the pyramid, designed to confuse robbers. In fact, several explorers have got lost and died in there. Of course, Giza is not just about the Great Pyramid, built to house Pharaoh Khufu in preparation for the next world. The second pyramid here is only one metre shorter and had only one burial chamber and that was built for Khufu's son, Pharaoh Khafre, who also constructed the Sphinx at the same time. The third pyramid is half the size of the Great Pyramid, but featured a much more complex mortuary temple inside. All of the entrances to the pyramids face north and the Sphinx is said to guard the complex. Now you've seen what incredible experiences await you on a Nile cruise, please consider giving this video a thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button because that will inspire us just as much as a box of chocolates and a warm hug. Why not also watch these to continue your journey through Egypt with us? Thank you.